Hello. I wanted just to add a little bit of content to what Mike and Dwayne's also been putting onto our Live Zones blog, uh, specifically around about the Rio Zones project. So as you know, we've been spending some time in Rio looking at the kind of pre-game situation in terms of securitization, the role of kind of uh, live zones, but also other urban spaces and what the Olympics have done or, or, or have created in terms of impact around about those spaces for uh, residents and others visiting Rio. I just thought it was important just to put a little bit of context around about that with two reflections. So two reflections on, I guess, what I've seen from afar um, looking at the situation in Rio pre-Olympics. So my first point and my first reflection is that there seems to be less regulation, uh, less policing, uh, specifically policing of the restrictions and exceptional legislation that we know is put in place, uh, is required to be put in place as a result of the um, host city contact for Olympic Games. What I mean by less regulation is that actually there seems to be a degree of, sort of freedom for whether that's you know entrepreneurs, whether it's small businesses, whether that's anyone moving around the spaces of Rio roundabout events, it's event venues, sorry. Um, it may be because what we're seeing is that the priority for policing and otherwise within the area is about um, security, is about readiness for the event itself, because we know that's been an issue in Rio, and also about the need to ensure that operational planning is in place so that ultimately when the Olympic Games start, uh, people feel that that Rio and the organisers have been ready. So perhaps that's why the policing and the, so that the security and policing of those particular spaces, event spaces, has been and appears to be at least less, less noticeable than we might have expected given what we've seen before around about these spaces. It's undoubtedly less regulated than we saw in London and and in my experience of looking at fan parks and live sites for the last number of mega sporting events in some of these other spaces too. Now we could we could make a couple of interpretations of that. We could also see that maybe this the kind of availability of local foodstuffs or of local cultural artifacts etc within some of the event zones indicates a kind of more global strategy where actually and there is a recognition that local businesses, local um, organisations need to benefit from hosting Olympic Games. Or, and perhaps in my view more likely, uh, this could simply reflect an acknowledgement of the maybe the impossibility or at least the real difficulty in actually the police and other authorities within Rio at this time really pursuing that agenda to, 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 to clamp down, if you like, on, on people trying to avoid and the, the, the regulations that, that are in place. So, uh, you know, it's likely, I think, that we'll see the, the regulation increasing and becoming, I guess, policed more effectively as the games progress. So we'll look at that as we update moving forward. My second um, main kind of interpretation and reflection um, on what we've seen pre-Olympic games is that the live sites or the the you know the special viewing areas uh, that, that that I've talked about with my colleague Matt Frew and also with Mike Dwayne more recently are more open, are more fluid, uh, appear to be less bounded, if you like, um, like like regular games venues um, than we've seen in previous iterations of mega events. Again, we'll see whether that changes, but. You know, in London, um, at Hyde Park, at Victoria Park during the Olympic Games of 2012, you know, it was security style um, entrances to uh, live sites. Live sites were commercial entities. They provided a captive audience for, um, a for, for, for a large number of people to watch the games, but also to purchase sponsors' products and for sponsors to activate um, their brands uh, using particular techniques. There seems to be less of that in Rio, or less obvious um, um, elements of that in Rio. Um, and and the events seem less like venues. Now, whether that's a deliberate strategy to make them feel more fluid, um, more like spaces that you can move in and out of and experience the, the kind of local culture, um, local foodstuffs, um, engage, participate in sports, as well as consuming brands in a more subtle way, um, I think we're yet to kind of work that out fully. Um, but certainly they seem and look in, in practice very different from, as I said, the very clear venue focused um, live sites and fan parks that we've seen in the iterations of previous events. Because 
if you look at something like the Euro Championships which took place in 2016 in France, um, you know the, these the venues that were that were seen and used were very heavily mediated, very much part of the broadcast spectacle, um, and they had to be because of concerns about terrorism and about other security issues, very much securitized, um, and that made them a certain type of bounded space. Uh, which was of interest to us and continues to be. So I'm interested to see what will happen over the next few days uh, and, and we'll update in terms of what my, my views are from afar. Mike will continue to update from his placement in Rio.